I'd like to read, read to you this morning from uh, Acts chapter 19. Uh, if you have your Bibles, uh, uh, pull them out. Uh, if you don't have your Bibles but you have a smartphone, uh, pull your smartphone out. If you have some data, uh, use your last remaining data to go to Acts chapter 19. Uh, I'm going to be reading in the New Living Translation. Very easy to do. You can just do a search on BibleGateway.com if you want, if you don't know where to find these uh, online. And look, for, just type in Acts 19 and push the button and all of a sudden it'll pop up. We're in a new age, aren't we? An incredible new age of, of technology. Uh, we, and what's incredible, there's a lot of bad uses of technology, but <clears throat> to be able to access God's Word this quickly, uh, and you don't even have to flip through. In, in the old days, we would take our Bibles out and the pastor would say, turn in your Bibles to such and so, and you were always you know, embarrassed if you didn't know where the Bible verse was in your Bible. You remember, you guys old enough to remember those days? And of course, you never wanted someone to actually see you looking in the index of your Bible to find the page number for, you know, for that. There's, so technology has really helped us out. Uh, we can save face in church now. Um, Acts chapter 19. I want to just read this to you. Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 20. I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus, on the coast where he found several believers. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed, he asked. No, they replied. We haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then what baptism did you experience, he asked. And they replied, the baptism of John. Paul said, John's baptism called for repentance from sin, but John himself told the people to believe in the one who would come later, meaning Jesus. As soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then, uh, then when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. Uh, there were about 12 men in all. Then Paul went to the synagogue and preached boldly for the next three months arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some became stubborn, rejecting his message and publicly speaking against the way. So Paul left the synagogue and took the believers with him. Then he held daily discussions at the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for the next two years, so that people throughout the province of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the word of the Lord. God gave Paul the power to perform unusual miracles. When handkerchiefs or aprons that had merely touched his skin were placed on sick people, they were healed of their diseases and evil spirits were expelled. A group of Jews was traveling from town to town casting out evil spirits. They tried to use the name of the Lord Jesus in their incantation saying, I command you in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a leading priest, were doing this. But one time when they tried it, the evil spirit replied, I know Jesus and I know Paul, but who are you? Then the man with the evil spirit leapt on them, overpowered them, and attacked them with such violence that they fled from the house naked and battered. The story of what happened spread quickly all through Ephesus to, G to the Jews and Greeks alike. A solemn fear descended on the city, and the name of the Lord Jesus was greatly honored. Many who became believers confessed their sinful practices. A number of them who had been practicing sorcery brought their incantation books and burned them at a public bonfire. The value of the books was several million dollars. So the message about the Lord spread widely and had a powerful effect. Jesus will always, always be magnified over every other name. He'll be lifted up above any other name we try to put in front of His, including our own, or some other leader, God will be glorified. And God will accomplish His purposes. Acts chapter 19 that we just read, 
I wanted you to see every single detail of it because uh, for most preachers, if you don't come from a, a um, I'm not even sure what to term this background, but if you don't come from a, a maybe an apostolic kind of a background or a, uh, uh, a prosperity or health and wealth kind of a church background, uh, this is not an easy passage to preach on. Uh, because it raises all kinds of questions. Uh, I don't know if you feel this way when you read the text, but it reminds me of a lot of churches that are doing this wrong, not many churches who are doing this correctly. And uh, I I want this morning to, to ask the question of what's normal in this passage and what can we apply for us today? What What should the church look like when the Spirit is free to move and operate like He wants to in our midst? Bearing in mind that the Holy Spirit is always working for the the fame of Jesus and moving that His name would be magnified. Laying on of hands, uh, tongues and prophecies, handkerchiefs and aprons. We could call this sermon this morning the handkerchiefs and aprons theology. Uh, There was a a pastor, uh, I think a false pastor, when I was a kid who used to... (laughs) He used to uh, send out uh, handkerchiefs, and you could, you could buy one of his handkerchiefs that had touched his body, you know, and so he made millions, well, thousands uh, of dollars uh, by people buying handkerchiefs that supposedly had been, that he had touched. Um, there was a big investigation uh, of this pastor in the United States, and they found that uh, a lot of the handkerchiefs that had been sent back to him, he had just thrown in the trash behind his, uh, his office, Anyway, he was arrested for fraud and conspiracy. It was just, we know these stories. This is one of many, many, many stories of this kind of stuff. Recently, I think a video passed around of a guy who uh, actually had someone rise from the dead. Did you, did you see that video? Um, it, it was not real, by the way, in case you're still wondering. Uh, it was an absolute fraud. Uh, incredible. But these are the kinds of things that we see in our world today, and so they distract us from the whole point and purpose of what God is about and what the Holy Spirit wants to do in our lives. I really believe firmly that this morning our goal is not to to quench the Spirit or to discredit uh, God in any way. That's my goal, is not to discredit Him in any way. I do want to discredit people who who are frauds. I want to discredit uh, work that is not of God. But I do want to glorify and magnify the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ and how he expresses himself through the Holy Spirit can manifest in many, many different ways. I think probably many of us in this room can tell stories of ways that the Spirit has worked in our lives that doesn't make logical sense or is not maybe something that we've seen uh, ever before in our lives. And so it's different. It's unique. Maybe a voice from the Lord. uh, Maybe you've actually touched a handkerchief that touched a holy person. I don't know. But... uh, These, as we see in Scripture, we see that uh, so much of what we read very often is is confusing or interesting or shocking to us as we look about and think about what God actually wants to do. I want to summarize this into a category of how I believe uh, God works. I believe that regardless of how the Holy Spirit manifests Himself, whether it's through spiritual gifts, uh, tongues, prophecies, whether he, he, is, is, he ministers to people through the laying on of hands, um, whatever it is, and however the Holy Spirit chooses to manifest himself, it will always be 100% for the sake of the, the fame of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit will always work for the fame of Jesus Christ. Not the one laying on hands, not the one who owns the apron or the handkerchief, Not the one speaking in tongues, not the one who's speaking a prophetic word, but it'll be for the sake of Christ himself. We live in a world today where we know, even the Bible says this, that in the last days there'll be manifestations that are not of him. There'll be miracles that'll take place that are not from God. Uh, We're warned of this in the book of Matthew, that that in the last days this will be common. I think we're in the last days. Uh, We see a lot of this that we know for sure is not from the Lord. The Holy Spirit, 100%, will always lift up the name of Jesus Christ. And He will always work to bring us to worship Him, not each other, 
and not a leader. He will always lift the name of Jesus Christ. I will say this. What we see in Acts chapter 19 is not necessarily a normative. In other words, we don't see this happen all the time. It's not something that we see in every church and all the time. Um, but it still happens. And the Holy Spirit uh, can act in however he wants to work. Why does, what does the church look like? And what, is, what should our church look like if, if truly we are filled with the Holy Spirit? How does that work? Well, it could be that all these that we've read about could happen. And we obviously don't want to in any way ever quench the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And especially as we're coming together as the body of Christ, we don't want to ever stop him from moving the way he wants to move in our midst. What we know for sure, though, is true for everyone is this, that when the Holy Spirit comes into our life, uh, it is a baptism of repentance and salvation and presence. The presence of God himself comes and dwells within us. That's for every believer. Presence of God. Uh, the issue for uh, those that we see in Acts chapter 19 here, the, those people that he met in the northern part of Ephesus, uh, were people who had never heard of, of actually, they never uh, had the encounter of, of being able to place their faith in Jesus Christ. So they had, they had been baptized by John but in, by, for repentance, but not for believing in Christ. If you read the text in Acts chapter 19, Paul comes and says the key here is, yes, you've been baptized for repentance of your sins, but you have not placed faith in Jesus Christ. That was the core issue. And that's why they had not received the Holy Spirit yet is because they had not put faith in Christ. Once they did that, then the Holy Spirit filled them. We believe that this filling of the Spirit, the baptism in the Spirit, and salvation are one and the same. And, and this is true, if you see this very clearly in Acts chapter 19, that that repentance and believing in Christ uh, were key to being baptized in the Spirit to receive the Holy Spirit. This was not some later event after they had decided to follow Christ. So be clear in Acts chapter 19. Understand this very clearly that this wasn't two separate events, that they had been saved by Christ and then they received the Holy Spirit later. No, no. The teaching of Scripture is very clear that baptism in the Spirit is, is the moment you become a child of God. So this, this filling of the Spirit that you see here uh, is at the point of birth, salvation. That needs to be very clear. We have to understand that very, very clearly. This isn't a separate experience. The Holy Spirit decided at salvation to express Himself through those believers in a very specific way, through tongues and prophecies. Is this normal? Is this always the case? No, it's not always the case. Matter of fact, if you read, and I challenge you to do this, well, maybe challenge is a bit of a strong word, but I encourage you to <laughs> encourage you to read through the book of Acts. Yeah, read through the book of Acts, and and see when the Holy Spirit comes in in salvation. When salvation comes through the Holy Spirit, mentioned in the book of Acts, how many times are these uh, supernatural gifts actually uh, seen or written about? Uh, only twice, uh, possibly three times. We're not sure about the third time, but this is mentioned in over nine times in the book of Acts. You see the coming of the Spirit, and uh, only in two, maybe three occasions do you see this expression of tongues and prophetic word. And sometimes there's a laying on of hands, sometimes there's not. But what is true of every single event spoken of throughout Scripture is that the Holy Spirit coming, His presence coming in our life is, is the start of salvation. That's true for every believer, His presence coming to us. How he chooses to express himself through you in whatever spiritual gifts he chooses to give you, that is his choice and his calling. The Bible teaches very clearly, Paul teaches, Paul who this story is about <clears throat> says very clearly that not everyone actually has every spiritual gift. That not, not all of us are going to have the same kind of manifestation in our lives that the Holy Spirit decides to do in us. Every one of us has different gifts and so we are parts of the body expressing different spiritual gifts and, and that's how the body works interdependent on each other. That's what the Holy Spirit set up. So His presence is true for all believers. His power is also, you'll see a, a little a stream of P uh, letters starting in the word, in the letter P here. So it'll be easy for you to remember. I did not do this on purpose, but the, 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 the letter P. These people. Uh, presence and God's power. 
We see this in Paul's life. Paul is boldly declaring the gospel because of the uh, presence of, of, of Christ in his life, the Holy Spirit moving in him. We see this in Peter. Peter, who denied Christ, all of a sudden he's boldly proclaiming Christ to his peril. He's persecuted because of it. And then there's this, uh, so presence, power, and then proclamation. People who are filled with the Spirit will begin to proclaim the goodness and greatness of our God. They'll become witnesses for Him. That's universal for all believers. God's presence, God's power, proclamation. Uh, this is true for all believers. We may, not, we may not all speak in tongues. We may not all prophesy. We may not all have the gift of healing. All the spiritual gifts that are listed, but all of us will have His presence. Oh, praise the Lord for His presence, His comfort, and for His, embold his emboldening power in our lives presence, power, and this ability to speak in ways you've never been able to speak before, the goodness of God, that you would be one who boldly speaks the gospel, the truth of Jesus Christ to others. That's true for all believers. It's a universal truth of the Holy Spirit. Acts 1.8 says this, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You will be my witnesses. This is a, something for all believers. Our goal, as we look at the movement and activity of the Holy Spirit, is not to stop what God wants to do with the Spirit, but to allow God through us to do whatever He wants. Part of, part of that expression that leads to the fame of Jesus is often above and beyond our understanding. The last thing we want to do is to stop the Spirit from doing whatever He wants in us so that the name of Jesus can be famous. We never want to be in a place where we're stopping how He wants to move in our life. Matter of fact, Scripture warns us that we should not despise the activity of the Holy Spirit. So often we look at, at wrong expressions that are not from the Holy Spirit, that, that are, are, are posing as the Spirit. And we decide that that's the Spirit and we despise it. We despise that when the Holy Spirit's name and, and His power is, is fraudulently expressed through, quote, the church, and we've been ripped off because of it. We've been lied to, our money's been stolen, whatever it is. We've had uh, hopes that are, that are false given to us, hoping that someone would be healed when actually that was not God's will for their life. All these things that we've been taught that are wrong. And so we've, we suffer from experience. But never can our response to the Holy Spirit be to shut Him down. Our response is to test the spirits and see which ones are true and which ones are right, but to allow the Holy Spirit to move in our lives. 1 Thessalonians 5.19-22 says, Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophecies. This is the words of Paul. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. We have doctrines and theologies very often that, that push us into a corner that says, oh, no, the prophecies don't even exist anymore. That's how much we despise them, is to say that it just doesn't happen anymore, and we, we crush it. God's Word teaches us not to despise, but to test and to hold accountable, but never to stop the movement of the Spirit in our lives. The Holy Spirit wants to move in this church. The Holy Spirit wants to move in my life. And I don't need to be shocked by how he might express himself through me and therefore quench him and push him aside. God gives us the right to actually quench him. But we're asked not to despise his work, but to allow him to flow freely in our lives. Paul goes on to say that let love be your highest goal. You should also desire the special abilities the Spirit gives. Not only should we not despise it, but we should desire the special abilities that the Holy Spirit gives us so that we can function for the fame of Jesus Christ. It's the whole point of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't lift Himself up. He lifts up Christ. And the Holy Spirit will never lift us up or someone other than us. Some famous apostle who drives a, a very expensive car and loves himself. This is not the work of the Holy Spirit. So be careful. And an easy test for you if you wonder if, if some church is true or false or if one speaking is true or false, 
Just, just examine his life and see who he lifts up. See who he magnifies. Does he love the name of Jesus more than his own? Does he love God more than he loves himself? Or does he love money and fame and pride? Is he really working for the fame of Jesus Christ? When you listen to these people speak, do you hear the gospel? Do you hear the truth of Christ permeating their message? If not, they're fraudulent. Because the Holy Spirit will always push the truth of Christ, the advancement and purposes of God. Look for it. If you don't see it, if you can read a whole book from one of these guys and you never hear the gospel, then you know there's a problem. My best life now. Amen. <laughs> Our best life is in Christ and Christ alone. And any other teaching is false. We neglect the Spirit. Uh, we neglect, and I, I think we, we quench the Spirit of God when we neglect the gift that God has given us. 1 Timothy 4.14 says, Do not neglect the spiritual gift you receive through the prophecy spoken over you when the elders of the church lay their hands on you. Again, prophetic words and people laying hands on others. Laying hands, by the way, is a common theme throughout Scripture. In the Old Testament, it's usually in reference to actually a, in a negative way that laying on of hands was actually to harm somebody. That's often... <laughs> so uh, you can hear your parents maybe will say to you at some point, I'm going to lay hands on you if you don't stop that. All right? That's one use of the word laying on of hands. But over and over again, the laying on of hands is this expression of, of compassion and comfort. The expression of you loving the person in a very specific, tangible way. Jesus laid hands on people throughout his ministry on earth. As a matter of fact, uh, through touch, very often. You know the, the woman who had an issue of blood? Just by touching him. She was healed, right? Uh, Jesus did other things, too, that maybe you would not want to happen to you. He spat in a person's eyes one time. Remember that story? All kinds of different types of touch. But to say this is normative or to say this is what happens all the time, is, would be wrong. But to also say that God doesn't work this way is also wrong. We are encouraged to actually do whatever the Holy Spirit wants to do through us. It could be laying on of hands. It could be that we love someone with that kind of touch. This is how God works. And God wants to work through you through the spiritual gift that he's given you. I think we can quench him. We can push him aside by not using the spiritual gift that God has given us. 2 Timothy 1.6 says, uh, for us to fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when, I, when he, he said, when Paul says, when I laid hands on you. You know, when you're trying to cook meat uh, and you have, you've started to bry fire and it's just not working, what do you do? You recruit the whole family, right? You make them put their faces right up against the fire you, and you make them blow on the fire. Is that a, have you done that, dads? Have you ever made your kids do that? I loved to do that when I was a kid. Please, let me blow on the fire. You know, we wanted to start fires and start raging fires. God asked us to, to blow into those, those flames that are dim and to get them burning again. Whatever spiritual gift God has given you, God wants you to flame it in, to, to, to blow into it so that it, it flames up and is active in your life. I think also, too, we quench the spirit when we, we turn off our emotions of joyful praise and expression. When we decide not to worship him with joy, and expression. I think we quench him in that way. The Holy Spirit moves through, through our worship of him, through song, through, uh, through spiritual songs and, and reading of scripture and, and fellowshipping together that we would joyfully praise his name through the work of the Holy Spirit. That's what he wants to do. And we, when we, we quench that, we push that aside, we push him aside. I think we also uh, quench the spirit when we actually sin, when we have a pet sin that we hang on to more than him. A sin in our life will always stop the movement of the Holy Spirit through us. All of us can relate to that. Come before Him. Confess your sins. He is faithful and just and He will forgive you of all unrighteousness. Live a life of holiness so that the Holy Spirit can flow through you like a river. May we not quench the Spirit by our behavior. We also quench the Spirit when we place our hope and depend on anything outside of God. Now, this is important for us because 
as Acts 19 comes to sort of this, the few last passages there, we see that this whole story moves to the name of Jesus being magnified. That the whole point of the, of the Spirit is to move us to the, to the fame of Jesus Christ, to push His fame and to live out the fame of Jesus Christ, that God would be glorified in us. That's the whole point of the Holy Spirit, is to move us to this adoration and love and praise of the name of Jesus, no other name. That's His point. So when we place our hope and we depend on things outside of God, we push the Holy Spirit aside. And we are living outside of what He wants in our lives. So whenever, whenever we are, quote, doing the work of God but doing it for ourselves or doing it uh, for the fame of anyone else other than God Himself, and we're placing our hope in anything outside of God, we are pushing aside the Holy Spirit and His activity in our life. One thing that was true of, of the early church and was true all through Scripture is that God wanted us to be in the state of awe of Him. This, where we are just amazed at who He is. We, we see this all through Scripture that moments where, where His people, His creation, lost sight of His greatness and His fame. Holy Spirit would, would gently move us and move people through history to understand that there is one God and only one is worthy of worship. He orchestrates creation so that they will be reminded of this over and over and over again that there is no other name we should lift up. There is no one else that we should worship. There's no one worthy of worship. We see this starting in the book of Job where Job questions the activity of God and God says this to him. He says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you know so much. Who determined its dimensions and stretched out the surveying line? What, su what supports its foundations and who laid its cornerstone? As the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy, who kept the sea inside its boundaries as it burst from the womb? As I clothed it with clouds and I wrapped it in thick darkness. God reminds Job who he is. And there's no one else worthy of worship than him. No one. Isaiah, who was brought and saw the vision of uh, the God high and lifted up. This is Isaiah 6, Isaiah's re reaction to seeing God high and lifted up. It says, I am undone. <laughs> I am a man of unclean lips. Praise the Lord that God was able to remind people through history that he is worthy of praise. And all of a sudden, in the presence of God, all of a sudden we realize that we are not him. And that we are not the point, but that He is the point. And as we worship Him, we've, we, we experience a purpose and a fullness and a joy that is unexplainable. This hope and this significance and purpose in life that we were looking for in everything else but Him can only be satisfied in Him. And so the Holy Spirit moves us to worship Him because He's worthy and because we need it. Him and only Him. We see this in Acts chapter 2, the tongues of fire. People are in awe of God. You see the last portion of Acts chapter 2 when it describes the New Testament church. It says, um, among many other things that they did, they were in fellowship, they, they sat under the, the apostles' teaching. But there's this one line there, I love it. It says that they stayed in awe of God. There was this constant realization that God is God and we are not. That God is famous and needs to continue to be famous and that we need to be less famous and that we find fulfillment and purpose as his name is glorified and he is lifted up but John the Baptist said this is what John said that I must what decrease and he must what increase I must decrease he must increase this is the teaching of scripture and God gently kindly reminds us of this point in this purpose that the name of Jesus will be lifted up God will be magnified I don't think it's a mistake or a misprint that the early church, the moment the Holy Spirit came and moved in them, that they were defined, they, they were known as people who stood in awe of God, who lived in this reverence and respect and fear and, and awesome wonder of God. If we look at uh, uh, Revelation 7 and discussing what, what the end of time is going to look like. It's going to be all of us standing where? Before the throne. Worshiping Him what? Day and night. You think, how is that possible? That something could be so extraordinary. Someone could be so extraordinary 
that we could just spend all of our days just loving him and worshiping him. See this in Revelation uh, chapter 7. I love it. I love this passage. It talks about those who, who suffer through the tribulation. Let me read this to you. It's so cool. Uh, when describing the people, the ones who survived the tribulation, who are dressed in white, standing before the throne, it says, these are the ones who died in the great tribulation. They have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb and made them white. That is why they stand in front of God's throne and serve him day and night in his temple. Because God is worthy, because God has cleansed us, because God has transformed us. The instant reaction here of, of these guys is, is not to just go do their own thing, but is actually to serve him day and night and to worship him. The, the response of being exposed to the presence of God is repentance, humility, and belief and all. Where we stand saying, Lord, who am I? Please change me. Make me different. I would just want to be in your presence. That's how extraordinary our God is. Oh, that we would stay in awe of our God. That above everything else, we would lift up the name of Jesus Christ and his fame. That's what the Holy Spirit wants to do in our lives. I believe it with all my heart. Holy Spirit wants to flow through us in ways that will amaze us. but for the fame of Jesus Christ and not for the fame of anyone else. He's worthy. He's worthy of our praise. Revelation 7 talks about who he is. It says he sits on the throne and gives them shelter. He protects us. They will never again be hungry or thirsty. They will never be scorched by the heat of the sun for the lamb on the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of life-giving water and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. This is what we hope for. This is what we share the gospel for, is that people would experience the sweetness of Christ and Christ alone. You see Acts chapter 19, that when they realized, when these people had been beat up by this, the sons of Sceva had been beat up and left naked, fear, the result of that was this fear that fell over them in reverence to God. And the result of that was repentance and believing and giving up the world and the things of this world to follow him and only him. And the conclusion of Acts 19 and that those last verses of, of uh, 18 through 20 is that the name of the Lord was magnified. In other words, the name of Jesus became famous when they realized, when they realized who God is. The name of Jesus became famous. Holy Spirit, very sweetly, very kindly, patiently, we see this through the book of Acts, reminds us of his point. Acts chapter 5, we see Ananias and Sapphira who lie to the Holy Spirit. They drop dead. Fear grips the church. They start worshiping him again. We see this all through Scripture. These gentle reminders. Acts 19 is no different. This reminder that it's only the name of Jesus, only Christ, that the Holy Spirit will lift up. This morning, as you try to navigate through the reality of this world and, and where we live, we will experience many more videos of people who are false prophets. We'll hear reports from many churches that are not true churches. We'll see a phenomenon that is not from God. But make no mistake, we will see the work of the Holy Spirit everywhere. And we'll see him operate and function in ways that are absolutely amazing and that truly lift up the name of Jesus Christ. May we not push those aside. And in our effort to be uh, pure, in our effort to be doctrinally sound, may we not get distracted by focusing on, on, on the false expressions of the church and quenching the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives and what he wants to do today. May we not get so distracted by others that we forget the mission of the fame of Jesus Christ. It's interesting that our doctrine even can be the distraction that keeps us from actually expressing and living for the fame of Jesus Christ. It's so easy today to get distracted by whatever theologies. Oh, may the Holy Spirit move in us however he wants. However he wants to express himself in you and in this church. And may we lift up the name of Jesus in every activity of our life. May we not quench 
his work in our lives. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we praise you. We thank you for your word that teaches us to lift up the name of Jesus. Lord, that teaches us that our hope is only in Christ. Holy Spirit, thank you for moving in our midst. Lord, thank you for, for being less so that Christ could be more. Lord, it's amazing to me that your humility is above and beyond what we can even imagine. Lord, how you lift up Christ. Oh, Lord Jesus, may we be led clearly by you to lift up him and no other. I praise you for this church. I praise you for its purpose and your plan. I praise you for the love that's in this body, in this, in this group. And Lord, may you be glorified in this place. Amen. Let's stand together. Let's worship.